Hello there and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. If you remember from our previous sessions, we are now in chapter 6, the big chapter 6, where we talk about how to believe. And so far we covered four sub-chapters. We talked about the fact that we as, new, as believers, as born-again believers in Christ Jesus, we received all the faith of God in our recreated spirit at the moment of salvation. Then we talked about the progressive release of that faith from the inside on the outside. And then we talked about the science behind faith and behind mind, the process of mind renewal. And we talked about brain neuroplasticity, about the conscious and subconscious mind. And finally, we discussed about faith releasers, factors that help us release more faith from our recreated spirit on the outside, in our mind, in our bodies, and into, uh, to, our, to other people. And we talked about the word, about praise and worship, about fasting, and about praying in tongues. And today we're continuing with the fifth subchapter where we talk about faith blockers. What are the things or some factors that block our faith or undermine our faith or kill our conviction? On, there are things that happen to us or things that we do which can choke or destroy our conviction altogether or block faith from coming out of our spirit, of, from the Holy Spirit and from our recreated spirit. And here I have three things that I thought about that I've seen that uh, from the Bible and from experience that they tend to undermine faith and to block our conviction. And the first uh, faith blocker that I'm talking about today is our sinful actions, sinful deeds. This, when, whenever, we, whenever we sin, those things, have sinful habits or accidental deeds, sinful deeds, those things, we are first and, more, uh, first and foremost as believers interested in not to sin. Not necessarily God, because from, from God's point of view, sin has been paid for once and for all. All our past, present, and future sins, they have been deleted. So from God's point of view, he cannot be upset or angry on us because sin was paid for. He is grieved, but that's different from being upset with us. Grief, grief, it's a pain, uh, uh, it's a pain coming out of love, seeing how he is grieved whenever he sees that we destroy ourselves. Sin has two, two things. Uh, when we sin, two things are happening. There is a relation between us and God. So uh, whenever we sin, God can be upset. But there's also another side to sin where it destroys us and produces death. And from God's point of view, he's no longer angry. He will never be angry on us because of our sins, because those have been paid for at the cross in full. But there is the other side that sin kills us. Sin produces death on all aspects, in all areas of our life. It destroys us destroys our faith, destroys our relationships, destroys our well-being, our peace. It, it brings death. So sinful actions create markers in our minds and it becomes more difficult after we sin. It becomes difficult for our mind to trust in God because of condemnation. If we just sin or did a sinful deed yesterday or last week and we are, uh, we, and we are in, a, in a place where we need God's help, we are reluctant to come and ask God for help because of the sins we did, we feel like we cannot trust God because he is upset. Although he is not, that's what we have to face in our minds. Our minds have difficulty to trust God again. And they begin to see God on the other side, separated from us. As he is holy, he is upset. We are out of fellowship. And I'll talk about, in another, about this in another series that we are not actually going out of fellowship from God when we sin. But I'll leave it for another time. So he is not upset, but in our minds, we see ourselves separated, detached from God. He is holy, and now we cannot approach him because we sin. We cannot even minister to someone else because we sin. And that's not true, but our minds have difficulty to believe. And the word, and you also have difficulty to believe that the word will actually work again. 
So uh, sinful actions block faith at all levels. You remain saved and justified, but it just makes you ineffective here on earth. Ministry-wise, you become ineffective because your sinful deeds create markers that bring condemnation. And then it's difficult for you to trust God in other areas. Here on earth, you will live like mere human beings, not like supernatural beings as God intended for us and what is expecting from us. And these sinful deeds also block faith by analogy. So it, it, uh, in one level, at one level, sinful deeds block faith by condemnation. You know, it's hard for you to trust God that he will help you or intervene because of your sin. But on another level, on a personal level, it's hard for you to trust God or to have faith in other areas for healing. Because if faith or the word didn't work, in the area of your sin to help you overcome so, and you were defeated in one area, what makes you think that you will have that uh, the word or faith will work in another area? Since you were defeated in that area of your sin, now what makes it, your mind will talk, will have a conversation and your mind will tell you now, what makes you think that the word or faith will work now when you face a different, a different challenge, a different obstacle or a different mountain? So sinful deeds will undermine your faith in two ways. First, through condemnation and will separate you from God. And second, through the by analogy. That's how our mind works. If you were defeated in one level, in one area at one time, that, that defeat and that uh, will create unbelief that will leak in other areas or in the same areas. And it will become more difficult for you now to trust the word of God because you were defeated in that area. So that's what our mind will tell you. The second factor, the second blocker, faith blocker, is past defeats or others, other people's experiences. If you prayed for healing for someone and they died, like it happened to me two or three times, that experience, that negative experience will create a powerful marker in your mind that will slow you down in your faith. How? Next time you have to minister to, to a similar thing, to a sim, for a similar sickness or a similar thing, the first thing that will come to your mind will be that negative experience that you had in the past and that one will block or weaken your conviction. Then there are the experiences of other people of God that we trust or respect or look up to and who didn't have results or ended shamefully. They died in a shameful way. And we, we look at those people like these great men of God that uh, had faith. They did a lot of things, but maybe they didn't have results or they had results and then they ended up shamefully. And we look up to them and the conversation in our minds goes like this. If they didn't make it, who are the great men of God, great men and women of God, who am I to think that I will make it or it will be different with me? Or that the word will actually work with me. That's the conversation that goes on in our minds. And that undermines your faith. If you look to other people or if you look to your past negative experiences. But you don't know what those people, those great men of God actually believed. You don't know what was their understanding of God. Their understanding of the word and what they spoke every day. What they meditated on. You could look at from the outside and see that they did great things, that they, maybe they did miracles, but you don't know what was going on in their hearts. And God can use even a donkey to, to minister to his people because he loves people. So even he can use people that have sins in their life that don't fully believe. He can use it once in a while. He can use those people to bless other people because he loves people. That doesn't mean necessarily that he approves those people's lifestyle or level of faith. Amen. So don't be deceived by what you see from the outside. You, because you don't know what goes inside. And don't let yourself, don't allow yourself to be undermined in your faith by other people's experiences. Amen. And the third the third factor or faith blocker is other distractions. Whenever you're distracted, even with innocent things, 
you expose your mind to something else than the Word of God. It can be even innocent. It's a blocker. It's a faith blocker because if you expose your mind and yourself long enough, you forget about the Word. It goes in the background, is no longer fresh, and it no longer produces a strong conviction. And these distractions can be pleasures of different kinds, sinful or unsinful, innocent, as I said, I call it innocent amusements. That's what Charles Finney calls it. Innocent amusements, innocent entertainment. That is good. It's okay. But if you go to extreme and if you, uh, if you expose yourself, the more you expose to movies, to other stuff, I don't, I don't know what your pleasure or innocent amusement or entertainment is. But as long as it keeps you from the word of God, your mind, whatever you see and hear, it will go to your subconscious and it will replace and undermine the word there. It will choke the word. Pleasures, innocent entertainment, worries, depression, sudden afflictions, bitterness, offense. Whenever you're offended by someone, it chokes the word and it blocks the faith. Whenever you're in worry or depression, that's the opposite of the kingdom of God. And those things, even the Bible says in the parable of the sower, they choke the word. They choke faith and block faith. These are things that distract us, that, that keep, uh, keep us away from the Word of God, who bu which, builds our faith, which builds our mind so that we can release more faith. Everything we hear, say, or do every day will either strengthen or weaken our faith in the Word. Let me say this, that again. Everything we hear, say, see, or do every day will either strengthen or weaken our faith in the word and that's so true there is there is no middle ground or neutral ground there is none you're either strengthening or weakening your faith there's no new neutral ground that is why intentionally we need to hear to say to see to meditate and do those things that strengthen and enhance our confidence in the word we need to be intentional about it to put the word in us the to expose ourselves our minds our even our five senses to the things that you can build our mind renew our mind and release more faith you're you're never on the middle ground you're either exposing to something else than the word and that will weaken your faith nevertheless by analogy or by uh, or even by the concepts or the the beliefs that are imp uh, uh, inputted into you through entertainment there are so many negative and evil subtle things that get into your mind and create beliefs from movies and from uh, different entertainment ways you you are you will not believe it and they are strategically and intentionally designed by the devil to to wash our brains if you'll notice, just to give you an example, lately in the last couple of years, you'll notice that almost any new movie from, the, from Hollywood will contain something related to homosexuals or lesbians. Why? That wasn't true in the past. Movies were uh, much more cleaner. Now, in our days, they sh they, almost every movie contains something like that. Why? Because Hollywood and the whole, this industry and all the pressure there is now to accept homosexualism, which I'm not, I'm not against people that are that. I don't, I, I love them, but the, the, the practice in itself is condemned by the Bible. So we can and you will notice that the whole industry of entertainment now creates things to wash our minds and to, to become more lenient with the practice, more used to, and to not be so upheld by this, and to not be so surprised, to get our mind used with the practice, and to slowly to accept, to accept it in our hearts. And if you, and if you expose yourself long enough to these scenes, to these uh, perspectives, to these beliefs, your heart will start accepting them without even noticing it. Because your heart, your subconscious, is like a 24-7 recorder. And whatever you put in your heart, that's why the Bible says to guard your, our hearts with all diligence. Because out of it come 
the issues of life. Whatever you put in, it will get out. If you put negativity, if you put unbelief, if you put anything else than the word, then that's what is going to come out through your words. That's what will form your belief, your perspective, your worldview, your perspective on life. And that's what will come out and will create your reality. So that's why it's so important to be intentionally about putting the word of God in us, about worshiping God, about praying in tongues, about fasting, about doing these things that help us release the faith and the power of God. Let's read, if you have your Bibles ready, let's read one, one passage from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any English translation that you have available. Let's read it together. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. I'll read it one more time. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Have you seen this part of the verse? God, yeah, yeah, we know that God can do uh, anything exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, but we forget about the second part of the verse that says, according to or based on the power or the level of power that works through us, that flows through us. So God can do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, but it will happen according to the power that works in us and through us the amount of power that we are able to release yes we have all the power of god all the fullness of god locked inside of us in our recreated spirit but god will do depending will do anything everything that god does will do it depending on how much faith how much power works within you how much you renew your mind to release that faith and to release that power. Amen? So these were a few faith blockers that block our faith or undermine our conviction and the less power is released. And we talked about also faith releases. Now we move on to the sixth subchapter of this big chapter, How to Believe, where we talk about not faith in your faith, not faith in our faith. We don't have faith in our faith. We have this tendency, uh, whenever we are put in a place to minister, to ask ourselves, our mind will be like that. Do I have enough faith to pray for this sickness? Do I have enough faith to approach this? I don't know if it happened to you, but it happened to me. That's why I'm, I'm dealing with it here. But if we put our faith in our faith, if we trust in uh, uh, the amount of faith that we have, that is actually faith in us. And it's humanism. It's not faith in the word of God. It's faith on you, on how much you are able to believe. Whenever we have to minister to someone, we don't need to say, I don't know if I have enough faith. Run away from that because that will undermine your faith. By saying that, you're actually saying that you don't know if God can be trusted or not. That's what you're saying when you say, I, I don't know if I have enough faith. You are saying that you don't know if God can be trusted or not. That's what you're actually saying. You're, you're not sure if God can be trusted or not to keep his word. So run away from that. Whenever you're tempted with that thought, I don't know if I have enough faith. Remember that when you accept that, you're actually saying, I don't know if I, could be, if I can trust God's word or not. That's what we're saying, and we don't want to say that. Plus, as I said in previous sessions, we will never feel that we have enough faith if we go on that route of logic and reasoning. There will never be a moment in your life where you will feel that you have enough faith to pray for someone. Because we're humans. And that's self-righteousness. So we, do, we don't put our faith, we don't put faith in our faith, but we put faith in the word of God. And we cannot do anything at the moment of ministry. Like I'm, I'm here with a sick person in front of me and all of a sudden I wonder, do I have enough faith? Even if you don't have, you, can do, you cannot do anything at that moment to build your faith or to grow, uh, to release more faith. Whatever level of conviction you have, that's why it's so important to be all the time 
releasing our faith and, and do those things that release more of our faith and always be prepared because when you're faced with a difficulty you don't have time to release faith or to build yourself your mind to release faith you need to do it before that but whatever level of conviction and faith you have at that moment just go ahead with it don't try don't start asking yourself do i have enough faith do i because that will undermine even more the level of conviction that you have at that moment in the word of god and the results will come anyway either faster or slower but they will come depending on how convinced you are and how how strong you are in your conviction in your mind about the word of god the results will come slower or faster completely or partially that's why we experience slower healings or partial healings and not complete healings because the level of our conviction is different varies from from a, from a, a different moments in different times amen so when talking about faith we are not dealing with an amount of faith that we need to grow it is rather a matter of perseverance and patience in training yourself to release more of faith you don't need to ask yourself, do I have the, the enough amount of faith to, to, to deal with this sickness or with this obstacle? There's no an amount of faith. You just need to start where you are and then persevere and stay strong in what you said. Let's say you have a sick person and the medical report for, for that person shows one thing, which is usually negative, but the Bible says something else, that the end result needs to be complete healing. Then we lay our hands over the sick person and after that, and we pray and we, uh, we command to be healed. But after that, we persevere in that conviction and faith that we had until we see the end result. Even if we don't see anything at that moment, we stay strong in our conviction and we persevere. Maybe we pray another time when we see the person, but we persevere in our minds until we see the end result amen and when i minister to a sick person i don't focus on the sickness and try to believe that it will live or try to convince my mind that it will disappear you don't focus to convince your mind oh i see the sickness but that sickness is not there it's, it needs to disappear that's not what faith is i don't focus on trying to see the sickness disappearing like uh, like picture like to picture it gone you try to picture your mind that it's gone that is very hard and it's not what the bible says that's now that's not how faith works and also we don't need to focus on how healing will happen on how will god do it or when you don't need to think about these things you just need to know it will happen that's what what faith is because Otherwise, this is positivism, positivism, and this is what the so-called the secret movement propagates. You see, your, you see a negative thing in your life, and you try to convince your mind through different ways that is not there, that is, is gone. And that's positivism. It's not faith. It's not faith in the world. What we, what we need to do is to focus our faith on the word of God that was spoken by God about that situation not on the sickness itself or on the problem to try to picture it gone you focus your mind I don't I don't care what the problem is I don't care how the problem will be fixed or the sickness will be healed or when what I care about and what I know for sure that it will that's what the word of God says and that's what we need to look in our mind when we attack a sickness or we attack a problem or we say to a mountain to move okay we don't look at the mountain and try to concentrate and try to picture it and imagine it gone can you see the difference no i don't look at the mountain and try to picture it. how will this happen when will this happen no i don't look i look at the word of god i don't care about the mountain the word of god says that whatever the mountain is it will be gone so that's what we need to believe and it's easier to do that than to try to picture it gone <laughs> Amen. So what God said in his word about that situation, it's a law in the spiritual realm and it needs to happen no matter what. That's the conviction that we need to have. What God said about my problem about sickness 
It's a law in the spiritual realm. It needs to happen no matter what. The Word of God will never come back void. And that's what we need to focus our mind on. And when we begin focusing on the Word, thoughts of doubt and unbelief might come to our mind to tempt us. But that is all they are. Temptation. They don't, they don't actually, they didn't actually got you out of faith yet. They are a temptation. Having thoughts of unbelief doesn't mean that you are already in unbelief. That's a great temptation. Because the moment we receive thoughts, what if it doesn't happen? What if it will not work? When we receive those, those thoughts of doubt, we immediately think that we, also, we are also in unbelief. We are out of faith. And it's not true. They are just a temptation. You are still in faith. And I'll explain. You are walking in unbelief when you let and allow those thoughts to influence and change your actions and speech. That's when you slide in unbelief. But until then, they are just a temptation. You can choose to disconsider them. You are not yet in unbelief. You are not yet out of faith. Amen? And I'll give an example here. When we fast a food, isn't it true that we are sometimes tempted to eat? When you see food where you smell something nice and you're fasting, you receive a strong temptation to eat. But that is all that is. Does that temptation in itself break your fast? No. The temptation, the smell, whatever urge or a hunger pangs you have, they are not breaking your fast. When is your fast break, broken? If you, let, if you let that smell or that, uh, that hunger pangs linger long enough in our mind and we start like playing with the thought, what if I eat or I miss eating? And if we linger on those thoughts, Sooner or later, they will surely break our fast. Do you see the, how, how things happen? Uh, in a similar way, whenever temptation comes, it, it doesn't put us in unbelief immediately. But if we linger and we accept those thoughts, then we, our actions and speech will start changing and aligning themselves with those thoughts. And you slide in unbelief. The same thing happened to Eve in the Garden of Eden, there was no problem about the temptation to eat the forbidden fruit. Temptation came, but she was not yet dead. She was not yet in sin. She could have looked, she could have been, been tempted to, about, about the fruit, but she actually sinned the moment she acted on the temptation. And that's the same thing that we, with our faith. We can be tempted to go in unbelief with our thoughts. And the devil, that's where he attacks us with thoughts. And some unbelief thought, thoughts can come even from ourselves. But they put us in unbelief the moment we allow them to change our actions and speech. Amen. This is so important and so subtle. So, so never allow those thoughts to tell you that you are already in unbelief. So why bother? What's the use? Like, like, I, I better not pray. I better not believe or I'll be more reserved or I'll avoid the situation. No. If those thoughts changed your actions, that you, then you are really in unbelief. Amen. Let's move on to the seven subchapter where we talk about calling the things that are not. Here is another secret of faith. Calling things that are not. And let's read one passage from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 19. It says this, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to uh, those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and called, calls those things which do not exist as though they did. I'll read it again. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. 
who contrary to hope in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Amen. So another principle of faith, we are in the big chapter on how to believe. Another principle about faith is the following. There is a great difference between calling things that are not as though they were and calling things that are as though they are not. It's a, it's a play of words, but let, let me say it again. It's a big difference between calling things that are not, that don't exist as though they were, and calling things that are, or we see them, exist as though they are not. They are very different. God's method is to call things that are not, that don't exist yet. Call them into being. Not to call what you see as it doesn't exist. In other words, he calls them into manifestation. By doing that, he nullifies or cancels the problem that exists. And I'll give an example in a moment. So if the problem exists... You don't deny that the problem exists. That's, what, that's a mistake that uh, so many ministers of God do. You don't deny that the problem exists. Or look at it and say, no, it's not there. Because it's there. You cannot deny it. It's what you see. It's what you feel. And it's there. There's a problem. So if you're sick, you don't deny that you are sick. You say by saying, no, I'm not sick. I'm not sick. Because you are sick. But on the other hand, you don't want to always be confessing your sickness either. So you are sick. You don't deny that, but also you don't want to confess that you're sick. So what's the balance? How do we do it? Some who misunderstand this message think that if they are sick, they should say, I'm not sick. Just denying that you are sick, it won't make you well. You, you believe that by saying, I, I'm not sick. I'm not sick. You think that you, it will make you well, but it won't, it won't. In fact, that could be a lie. You will lie to yourself because the sickness is there. And you say, I'm not sick, but you know that the sickness is there and you lie to yourself. But there's a difference between a lie and a confession. Confession is a method of calling things that are not as though they were. If I am sick, I will confess. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I am delivered from the authority of darkness. I am redeemed from the curse of the law. I am calling my body well and, and healthy in Jesus' name. You proclaim and confess what the word of God says. In other words, you call into being health. You're not focusing on negative saying, I'm not sick, but you're saying, I'm healthy. Do you see the difference? There's a big difference because uh, when you say, I'm not sick, you're trying to, to call things that are as though they are not. But when you say, I am healthy and I, I am healed in Jesus' stripes, you call things that are not as though they were. Do you see the difference? I am not denying sickness, as I said. I am denying its right to continue to exist in my body. Yes, we are attacked. Even as Christians, we are attacked by sickness because we live in this world. And we don't deny it that we have a sickness or it attacked us. But what we deny, we deny its lawful right to continue to exist in our body. It's, not, it's illegal for a sickness to exist in our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we deny its right to stay there when it comes. When it comes, it needs to go out the way it came. So I'm calling for health and for healing in my body. Instead of saying that I am not sick. That's God's method of how to believe and how to manifest faith. To call things that are not. That are spoken in the word of God that don't exist and you call them into being. And when you call health into being, automatically it will cancel your sickness, right? But I don't say I'm not sick. That's the secret movement way of doing things. They are focusing and trying to picture things that they are, they are as they, they are not. That's what the secret does. If you ever heard about the secret or the new age thing. And that's not God's method. God's method is to focus on what he has said and call that into existence. Amen. And this is a matter of agreeing with the truth of God and not with the facts. You don't agree with what has happened to you, but you agree and confess with what God has said about that situation. 
although you don't agree with the facts and with the reality that you see, you don't deny them, but you disconsider them. You focus on something else. And if you notice in verse 19, I go ahead of myself, Abraham was aware and saw the facts that his body was dead. You see, have you seen in verse 19? He saw that his body was dead, that Sarah's womb was dead, that, that they were very old. He saw those facts and he didn't deny them, but he denied to allow them to affect his faith. He disconsidered them. He chose not to consider them. They were there, didn't deny them, but not consider them, not allow them to change your way of thinking and your actions. He didn't deny, but he disconsidered them. And I'll give again the example of fasting. That's a very illustrative example. When you fast, the hunger pangs are sometimes of, uh, so strong and they are a fact. They are a reality. You feel them. You see them, the hunger pangs. You want to eat so badly, but you choose to disconsider them. You don't deny them, but you disconsider them. And that's what faith, that's how faith works. Amen. Now let's move on to subchapter 8, where we talk about the gift of faith versus faith development by renewing your mind. You can be healed by a gift, by a gift that someone has from God, a gift of faith or a gift of healing that someone might have. And there are people, there were people and there are people that have gifts from God as the Holy Spirit wills. See, the Holy Spirit decides when to give those gifts and he gives gifts to people, gifts of faith or gifts of healing. However, the fact that the person operates in the gift of faith doesn't have anything to do or very little to do with the spiritual development of that person in faith. Or the faith de development as a fruit by renewal of the mind with the word. They are two separate things. And there's a difference there. The New Testament book where Paul talks more, most extensively about the gifts of the Spirit is 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 12. However, he also says about those Christians that they were carnal. The Corinthian church was very carnal. And that's the place where he talks the most, the most comprehensive chapter on spiritual gifts. Isn't that interesting? This is the only book where the church is specifically told that it was carnal. carnal. To the most carnal church then, he gave the most comprehensive list of the gifts of the Spirit. And he said that the Spirit wills, not we don't will, but the Spirit wills. He decides when to give those gifts. Today in the church, we believe that if we get spiritual enough, maybe God will give us a gift. That's the most common belief. That if we are spiritual enough, we, if we get holy enough, if we are pre prepared enough, then maybe God will bestow on us, will give us a gift. And we struggle for that and we wait for that. And it is, it is exactly the opposite. The more spiritual you are, the less spiritual gifts you need. And I'll say it again because this is powerful. The more spiritual you are in the true sense of the word, the more spiritual you are, the more established in the word and in faith you are, the less spiritual gifts you need from the Holy Spirit. The more carnal you are on the other side, the more God has to show up with bursts of power here and there and heal people himself because he loves them. Not because of your faith. He will show these bursts, these revivals, these spiritual gifts out of his love and mercy for those people that are suffering, that are in sickness. But this, this is not his way of functioning in the New Testament. This is not the rule of thumb. This is not the way... He wants to do things to heal himself or to give us spiritual gifts. He wants us to grow in the word, in the word, in what he said, and then perform those miracles on a regular basis, repeatedly. Learn how to do them and work them out with the salvation that you have inside of you. The gift is just poured out into you by the Holy Spirit without your cooperation in spiritual growth. You, all of a sudden, you wake, you wake up one day and you just make a prayer for someone and that guy or that uh, person gets healed. And you're like, what? I didn't even have faith. That's a spiritual gift. That's a gift of healing or faith that God puts on you without your cooperation, without spiritual growth on your side. That is how revivals happened in the past and how one man shows happened. 
until now because the church as a whole didn't have enough revelation but now globally God is giving us more revelation if you're if you are in the spirit enough and you, you are sensitive enough to see things in the spirit and to perceive what God is doing today in the global body of Christ he's giving more revelation how to grow in things how to do these things on a regular basis so these one man shows and revivals in the past happened because God had mercy on the church but that is not the norm for the New Testament church. And I'm not looking for a revival in order to see miracles. That's what the body of Christ does in so many places today. They are looking for a revival, praying for a revival, waiting for a revival, fasting and humbling and praying for a revival so that they will see miracles. But we have become the revival. Wherever we go, we're supposed to revive things through the sal through salvation that was given to us. We are the revival. We don't need an outpouring from God. It's, it's not that I don't want it or that I, I don't like it when God does that. I fully embrace that. But that's not how God, that's not God's ways in the New Testament. That's not how God expects us to function. We are the revival. Wherever we go, we need to be the revival. If we get the understanding and if we are strong in the word, in faith, and we live, and we should live revived all the time, live on a revival. If we do those things that I mentioned in the faith releases chapter, we are always revived. We are always pouring out life into people. Everywhere we go, we spread the aroma of the knowledge of His Son. And that's why we, God causes us to walk in triumph all the time. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians. William Booth said once, I am not looking for a move of God. I am the move of God. That's how God works in the New Testament with the new creation. We have become the move of God. We are not expecting from God for God to move. We are not begging Him or imploring Him to come down by praying and worshiping and we're crying and God come, come God have mercy come no he has already given us everything we need to do revival wherever we go and to give life to people to allow the Holy Spirit to flow with rivers of life out of us into people with healing reconciliation deliverance peace pro prophetic words encouragement love grace amen that might be a game changer for many of you who are listening to me right now. And it might be difficult to receive it, but just don't disconsider it. Just think about this and try to see by the Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you more light if you're not convinced of this. Most times, those people with gifts have become bankrupt in all the other areas of their lives. And if you look carefully to different, I'm not saying that all of them, all the one main show, all the people of God that ever were, uh, worked in miraculous ended up badly. But most of them who had a gift, they were bankrupt in other areas of their lives. Uh, that, that could be doctrinal accuracy. They, they can have it right. On, in one area of the Bible, in one doctrine, but then have it wrong in all the other doctrines or most of other doctrines. They got it right in one, in one thing, but then they got it wrong in another thing. So, and it's a great temptation to take the whole teaching of a person who does miracles. But not, it's not always the case. They might be accurate in, in the area of healing or have a gift of healing, but not be so accurate in other areas. And there are so many examples of this. Uh, another uh, bankruptcy area, no godly character. Many people with the gift, they neglect their character and they believe wrongly that God approves them, approves of, uh, approves of their way of life because he works through them. But God working through you and performing miracles through you and doing, giving you spiritual gifts doesn't mean that he approves with your way of life. He used even a donkey. And the Romans says that he is not sorry of calling and he is not changing his mind. He's not sorry when he calls someone. His, his calling and his gifts are irrevocable. That's what the Bible says. But that doesn't mean he approves your way of being and your way of uh, your character or your negative character maybe. So we need to be very careful. So these people, all they got was the gift, was a gift that they didn't work for, they didn't grow spiritually, they didn't cooperate in anything, they didn't renew their mind, they just got a gift. 
and that they used it, but they neglected all the others, all the other areas of their life. So a gift is good. If you haven't praised the Lord, you can use it to increase your faith in other areas. I'm not saying that gifts are not good. I'm saying that when you have a gift, it's not the rule of thumb, it's not the norm. We shouldn't wait for those, but grow in the word and renew our minds and not neglect other areas of doctrine of character whenever we have a gift. Ultimately, the most, most of them failed miserably because of that, because they neglected other areas of their life. They were more prone to pride and failure because they didn't have a sustained, holistic, spiritual growth in all areas of life. And if you need help, go and ask that person to pray for you. But don't listen to their teaching most of the times. If you are sick and you need help and you know a person that has a gift of feeling or a gift of faith, go get help, be healed. But don't listen to everything they say, to all their teaching, that because they might be wrong in other areas. Gifts have nothing to do with spiritual maturity. And I'll say it again. Spiritual gifts have nothing to do with spiritual maturity. You are not more mature spiritually if you have a gift necessarily. Jesus never operated by gifts. The Bible says that he perceived other people's thoughts. He healed. He prophesied. Jesus operated in the fullness of the Spirit. And when you operate like that, you can fulfill different needs at different times. Amen? You can fulfill different needs at different times. It doesn't matter what the problem is. If you function and operate in the fullness of the Spirit, you always have a solution. You always have the solution to any problem. You don't need a special gift for a different area. Do you see the difference? Let's read one, one passage from Romans chapter 1, verse 11. For I long to see you, says Paul, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. See here what Paul says, so, my, so I may impart to you a spiritual gift. When Paul speaks here about imparting some spiritual gift, he is talking about spiritual blessings like a healing, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, teaching, prophecy. There are so many spiritual gifts and he wanted to impart some of those according to need. These are the spiritual gifts he was talking about and they all function through the fullness of the Spirit according to the needs. They are not to be separate only on certain people and for life. So we shouldn't function in only one gift for life. We should grow and walk in the fullness of the Spirit. This all goes back to the new creation filter that I was talking about in the beginning. This applies here. If you don't have that filter and that mindset of what the new creation actually is, then it's hard for you to, to receive this. That the spiritual gifts are not the same thing with spiritual growth or spiritual maturity. When you are born again, your spirit is recreated and then by the renewal of the mind, you start manifesting all the qualities and abilities of the fullness of the Father, all spiritual gifts. By your new birth, you have access, if you, I may so, say so, you have access to all the spiritual gifts. But you need to renew your mind. It doesn't come overnight unless God just gives it to you and puts it in your mind. The new creation is not supposed to function by gifts, uh, like limited by gifts, but by the fullness of the Spirit. Because that's what we have. We have the Spirit without measure exactly like Jesus had it because God and Jesus sent us in the same way God sent him and God sent him to speak the word of God and he gave him the spirit without measure the gospel of John says in the old testament when the prophets were giving prophecies they were killed if they didn't get it right if they didn't get the prophecy from God accurately that's what was happening in the old testament all they had to do was to say what they heard from God, many times audibly. There was no interpretation, nothing. They just heard, delivered, and people had to believe. God didn't work through their soul. God just spoke to them and they said exactly what they heard. In the New Testament, I don't know why I'm talking about the prophecy, but it might help someone. In the New Testament, it doesn't work that way. God works from the recreated spirit through the soul. That is why many times the message of God can be tainted. 
by our soulish thoughts, soulish things, if we are not renewed enough. And we are told in the Bible to judge, examine, analyze prophecy, make sure it is accurate scripturally, and then take only what is good. What is bad, just put it away. So God works from our spirit through our soul in the New Testament. I think the, the example of prophecy can help us see the difference between spiritual gifts and renewal of mind in other areas as well. Let's say someone comes to you and gives you a prophecy like this. And here I'm giving an example and there are many similar examples like this. I could go on and on. Let's say that this person comes and prophesies over you like this. God is moving you into new things, into a new anointing. A double portion of his power will come upon you. This is the prophecy. And we, we, it's very familiar to me at least. Now, when you hear that, you can realize that in some areas, the mind of that person is not renewed to the new creation mindset because there is no double portion in the New Testament. There's none. There's no this concept of double portion. That was in the Old Testament. The only double portion is being born again and filled with the fullness of the Spirit. There's no double, triple portions. There's the whole fullness of the Spirit. That's the truth. I have the Lord and I don't need a double portion. However, you can take the message that God is going to move you into, into some new things. So you see, from this just little prophecy, I was able to take something good that God wants to move me into new things, but I put out the fact that he wants to give me a double portion because he has, I know the truth because he has, has already given me the whole thing, not just a double portion. So that's how we judge and how we analyze. And that's how God wants us to function in the fullness of the spirit through our soul. Renew the filter of our soul, the mind, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind and align it, tune it to what the word of God says to the truth. That's what we're called to do. And that's how faith is released. And I think we have time for one more chapter, sub chapter 9, where we talk about great faith versus son faith. There are two people in the Gospels about which Jesus said that they had great faith. The first one is the Roman centurion in Matthew 8 verses 5 to 13. And second is the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 verses 21 to 28. And I could read them, but they are pretty long, so I'll, uh, I'll pass that. I will not read them, but you know what they are. I just gave you the references and you can go and read it yourself. Now, the reason why Jesus said that they had great faith was because they were both Gentiles and not connected to God by a relationship or covenant. They were outside of God's covenant and God's relation. They were not the people of God. They were Gentiles. And they didn't have access not even to the law through which God provided life to his people. And they didn't have any promise like Job did. They didn't have any promise from God. They didn't have any foundation on which to base their faith onto. That's why the Bible says that they had great faith because they didn't have any promise, any foundation, but they still manifested faith. However, as new creations, we are sons and daughters of God. We don't need great faith. We have all the faith and we are connected to God. I mean, uh, there is, there is a, a sense in which we have great faith or release greater and greater measures of faith. We grow from faith to faith and from glory to glory. But this great faith that these people, the Bible, that the Bible says that they had, this is not the same thing that we as new creations and sons and daughters of God have. They didn't have any promise on which to put their faith into from God. Example, how many of you know that if a beggar on the street asks me for $100, he might not get it. But if my son Justin asks me to buy him something or for $100, uh, he might get it. Why? Because he's connected to me. I love him. He's part of me. I am his father and he is my son and daughter. That's how things work in the New Testament. We are no longer slaves. We are no longer detached from God or separated. We, have, we are connected now. We have connections. We have connections in the high places. Amen. God is the God of the universe and He is our Father. Can you imagine that? We are His sons in the whole universe. All the creatures of the universe recognize us as sons. His sons and daughters. And we never question God's ability to do things, but His willingness to do them. Yes, God can do anything, can heal me, but will He? 
want to heal me now in this time in this place of this sickness and that is more hurtful than doubting the ability of God God's willingness trumps even his ability in other words God is more willing to heal us of any sickness anytime anywhere than his ability to heal us than the fact that he can do anything so his willing is greater, his will and his desire to heal us is greater than his capacity to do that. Amen? And that's what I'm trying to get across to you. Let's read one final verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where it says this, For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. All the promises of God are yes. Yes, I want to heal you. Yes, I want you to prosper. Yes, I want you to be victorious. Yes, and in Him, amen. All the promises of God. His willingness trumps even His ability to do those things. Amen. Here I will stop. We discussed a lot of things. We talked about today faith blockers. We talked about not having faith in your faith. We talk, talked about calling the things that are not. Then we talked about gift of faith versus faith development. We talk, and we ended up with great faith versus son or daughter faith. And next time we'll continue with a few more subsection, uh, subsections in this big chapter on how to believe. I, I'm, I hope that you learned a lot, that you received some understanding, some more revelation from God through His Holy Spirit. And I hope that this message has, has blessed your heart. And I hope that it will help you to grow in the things of God. And until we see next time, I pray that God will continue to bless you and surround you with His favor like a shield in the name of Jesus. Amen.